and we are live. I'd like to welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone to our joint webinar with ArcRide Consulting and Data Art. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all join us today and um, we will do delve into the transformative potential of the AI in retail banking and payment. Uh, my name is Alexander Golovanov. Um, I'm a solution consultant in Data Art. Uh, in Data Art, uh, we are technology experts delivering bespoke cloud native data driven solutions to our enterprise partners. And we do that successfully for more than 25 years. And uh, joining us, we have our partners from ArcRite who focus on strategic and management consultancy. I will introduce them in a second. So, everyone here, I believe, is aware of the pace of the technology technological innovations that happen today uh, and it's crucial for industry professionals to grasp the um, and leverage the opportunities that uh, AI presents. So aim of today's session is to provide the insights uh, that we prepared from a thorough research and uh, the practical applications that can redefine the future of the financial services. I'm excited about it. So um, I will announce that uh, based on the topic of today's session, we'll be sharing a joint research on the integration of the AI in the banking and the payment landscape. It uh, includes the comprehensive analysis and uh, latest trends um, and in, in the field. And um, also we included the practical steps to organize, uh, an, as we call it, an AI playground for experimenting with this exciting technology within your, uh, your organization. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'd like to engage our audience to ask questions in the chat. Don't be shy. Um, and uh, without further ado, let me introduce the speakers and uh, embark on this journey. So I'd like to start with our partners from ArcRite. We have Steven who is a partner at ArcRide Consulting and a head of payments and digital banking. Uh, they have offices across Nordics, UK, Germany, and the Middle East. He's been doing strategic level advisory uh, for nearly two decades. And uh, he strongly believes that generative AI will transform the industry. And um, he even says he believes it will do so um, at least as much as the introduction of the internet. So yeah, it will be a critical source of the future competitive advantage. Hi, Steven. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, also we have Yannick. Yannick is a part of Arkwright's payments and digital banking practice. He focuses on growth strategies and innovation projects. And uh, typically he is, his, his job includes the respective projects implementation as well. Um, apart from being an expert, I know that Yannick loves traveling throughout Europe with his wife and two kids, and they do that in an orange uh, Volkswagen camper van, uh, and, uh, which is, as far as I recall, 40 years old, right? Is it? That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Yannick. Yeah, and uh, from DataArt, joining us, we have uh, our experienced hands-on leader of the AI lab, uh, Dmitry Baikov. He is an expert with more, almost 10 years of broad expertise in financial services business domain, as well as technology, definitely. He has a strong focus on generative AI and uh, AI strategy applications. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. So... Um, should we jump into our presentation? Let me share this presentation. Do you see my screen? Perfect. So I will pass my word to Yannick. Right. Let's start on. Perfect. Um, thanks, Alex. I'm very happy to be here today to present um, to all of you. Um, here's what we covered today. Um, so first we'll take a quick look at the recent developments of AI. Um, we will then talk about the impact that it has in payments and banking. 
we will explore some opportunities um, for payment and banking with um, some real world examples um, presented by Dimitro. Um, and then Stephen will take over and uh, take a look on how to get started with AI, what the success factors are, and um, yeah, what, what uh, you can do um, practically to um, start exploring. Now, before we jump into the details, I want to start with a very quick and from my perspective, very provoking statement from Sam Altman. You probably all know Sam Altman. He's the CEO of um, OpenAI. And um, he said that ChatGPT is mildly embarrassing at best. GPT-4 is the dumbest model any of you will ever have to use again by a lot, which is crazy because he's basically bashing his own product. And uh, he can only do that if he's very confident that he can deliver a way better solution in the future. Um, so he also said that GPT-5 will be way better than GPT-4, and then GPT-6 will be the next big milestone after that, um, where we can expect um, pretty much. So he also added in a different interview that he doesn't care if he burns 500 million or 5 billion or 50 billion, which is a pretty nice thing that you can say when you're probably the most hyped company on the planet at the moment, um, which unfortunately most of us cannot say, um, but it also shows like how much money is actually flowing into AI at the moment and um, how, how much momentum this whole topic has. So let's take a look at um, what the current and latest developments are. And let's keep the statement from Sam Altman in mind. Um, there are probably many, many more developments. You could you could talk days about the latest models and uh, new um, crazy things that are happening in AI. But um, today I want to like focus on the first um, these three, um, which are the performance of AI models, which is skyrocketing, the multi-modality of language models, and the last one, which is not that much in the media from my perspective, um, the whole part on miniaturization. So starting with the first one, performance of AI models, um, there is a Stanford AI index, which compares the human abilities for certain tasks with the performance of AI models. And what you can see here is that basically for many, especially easier tasks, um, AI is already surpassing the human capabilities. What is way more interesting is that for the more complex tasks, where, for example, for complex maths on competition level, where we were below 10% compared to human capabilities in 2021, we are now very, very close that AI is on the same level. And when you look at how, how much acceleration we have right there, um, how much the capabilities of these models are growing, this is a very significant development, which is uh, quite promising for the future. The second part we want to talk about, and you probably have heard about it, is multimodal language models. Now, what does multimodal mean? It means that uh, the model itself can process and interpret and um, work with different types of um, inputs, like text and speech and images and audio and so on and so forth. Um, you probably heard the news about GPT 4.0, where the O is for omni, meaning that there are multiple channels that it can use to communicate with um, somebody else. And um, you might think that, hmm, I'm wondering, wasn't there a possibility to use my voice for ChatGPT before that? And um, actually, you're right, if you thought so. Um, the big difference is that before that, there was a very small algorithm which took your voice, translated it to text, and then it was just the basic text-based GPT model. What happens now is that the models can actually work with more data points and the whole like input channels integrated into the model. So what happens that the way you speak, the speed or the tone and so on and so forth will be part of this whole data that is fed into the program and then therefore it uh, has way bigger capabilities. Um, Funny enough, uh, Google announced one day later that they also can do that. Um, they haven't released it yet, um, but um, we can stay tuned for their project Astra, um, which is coming soon probably. And then with these two first points, we were talking about 
bigger, faster, stronger. Um, everything has more capability. And, and then there's this other trend of miniaturization, which is probably even more interesting because what happens there is that models become way, way smaller. Um, what does that mean? It means that they can bring very high performance, but are way smaller. And this is way important for the use of resources, which has to be efficient. It's a key challenge that um, you need to choose the right model because um, I'm not sure who said that to me, but uh, once there was a comparison um, of solving every single problem with a large language model, it's like uh, delivering pizza with a Lamborghini. Um, you, you can do it, it's probably a slight bit faster, but still probably not the smartest solution in the world. So when we look at these different developments, um, we can assume that the rapid development that we've seen in the last 18 months um, will continue to go on like this. Um, we are currently at the top of the hype cycle. We'll see how long we can stay there um, before the next phases will come. Um, but definitely, um, this is a very interesting moment currently. So the next question will be, what does it mean for banks? And um, I've brought another quote for this. Um, it's from Jamie Dimon. Um, he's the CEO of JP Morgan, which is a not so unimportant bank, I would say. And um, he said that, while we don't know the full effect or precise wage, rate at which AI will change the business, we are completely convinced the consequences will be extraordinary. And we all probably agree on the consequences will be extraordinary and so on and so forth. But the interesting part about this quote is that while we do not know the full effect or precise rate at which AI will change our business, that shows that even such a large bank who's investing so much into AI does not know where this will go. And it's a very, very high level of uncertainty currently where we are operating, which means that exploring and getting ready for AI for the future use cases where you put so many different options into your funnel and only a few will probably in the first step um, materialize as the real like working business solutions. Um, that's, that's the key task. So the big question is like, how ready are banks for this? And um, we can take a look at this um, activities of major banks when um, we take a look at the Evident um, AI Readiness Index. Evident is an intelligence platform. Um, they track and benchmark AI performance of banks, um, as you can see here. And um, they do this by different criteria. So they take a look at talent, like does the bank acquire the right, right people that you need to develop AI capabilities? They take a look at innovation. Um, do they do the research? Do they have any patents? Um, do they have any AI ventures? Um, they also look at leadership. Like, is there somebody like a chief of AI? Um, do they have it on their strategic agenda? Um, do they like communicate it openly that they are working on AI topics? And um, in this ranking, when we take a look at it, we see that the North American banks are pretty much dominating as well as they do for like American companies dominate the the language model um, space, and that other European banks are, apart from maybe IMG and UBS, a bit further behind, which is very interesting to see, which is a gap that um, Europe will need to close somehow in the future, and where um, everybody from our perspective um, might need to do probably a little bit more to close this gap and um, to potentially, on the other hand, learn quite a lot from those um, American banks. So um, we see many, many banks are prioritizing it as a key strategic area, and they are committed to AI for the future. Why are they so committed? That's the next big question. Like, What's, what's the actual potential of AI in payments and banking? And um, we've, we've put down a quote here that the European Investment Bank estimates that it could increase banks' revenues by 30% and reduce costs by 25 or more. You will probably find many, many different, um, uh, different sources on how much percent you can expect costs to, grow, uh, costs to decline and revenue to grow. We believe it 
highly depends on where you're coming from and which use cases you're able to materialize in the end. But you can basically separate it in some different like buckets on, on which you can work, like potential buckets, basically. And those are sophisticated risk management, um, screenlight ops and, op uh, and cost efficiency, and tailored growth. So starting on the left, we do know that risk management and using risk uh, AI for risk management has been around for decades. Like the big uh, credit card schemes are using it heavily for their fraud monitoring um, and their risk models. Um, but what, what changed in the last time is that accessibility and the power of the models itself became way, way higher. So this opens it up to use AI capabilities um, by smaller banks and to basically customize their own models in an easier way where they do not need such a big amount of data to treat it, such a big IT department to use it, but can rather um, use these models for their own smaller risk challenges that they might have. The second part, streamlined ops and cost efficiency, is the one where we see the most use cases that are actually live at the moment. I think um, many of you probably have heard of what Klarna has been doing. So they developed an AI assistant, and that one handled two thirds of customer service chats in the first month, which is approximately the job of around 700 people um, before that. Um, so this shows how capable these models can be in actually talking to the clients and actually interacting. And this is what is new and what is only possible because we have generative AI now. This was not possible beforehand. Um, probably you have experienced or you all have experienced chatbots um, from like five or 10 years ago, where it's basically just, um, you must find the right question from the FAQ and then you probably get the right answer. Um, this is getting way, way better at the moment. And this is a huge improvement that we see. And additionally, um, you can free up capacity and um, reallocate the resources that have been doing those very easy tasks beforehand to something that is more value adding to the overall company. And then the last part, which we don't see that much at the moment, but which we will probably see in the future way more, is tailored growth. So working on um, your uplift of revenue. And um, everybody has been talking about like hyper-personalization or contextual finance um, in the past. There were only very, very few examples where with very much effort, you could um, provide a good user experience. But um, through AI, it is um, possible to really do a step forward here. Um, we see that, for example, HSBC um, achieved a 15% uplift in their card spending um, because what they did was some smart limit, credit card limit handling. Um, they used AI to determine through various different factors of spend behavior, customer behavior, and so on and so forth to increase limits. And um, this uh, led to their customers spending way more. This would have been way tougher without AI because you would need to test more with the real um, with the real customer, and then you might lose some of them. You might have some um, negative effects on it. And um, AI is a real um, accelerator in this part right now. So these are the potentials, but. Um, Again, the question will be, how do, I, how do I leverage them? What can I do actually as a bank? And how do I get started? And um, what we've done for this is just as a starting point to put together a, we call it AI opportunity map. Um, this is an exemplary extract that you can see right here. And um, it, uh, it shows like across the value chain of payment and banking from product management for customer activation acquisition and um, customer relationship management through operations and executions towards risk and compliance, that there are many different opportunities um, that can focus on growth or they can focus on efficiency. Um, and these possibilities can, can act as a starting point to find things where um, you yourself might see, mm, I think we can get better right here and potentially AI can be a solution 
to do so. So we will not go into detail of all of those. This would uh, be way too much for today. Um, but I encourage you that you take it from, from this presentation um, and uh, take a deeper look or you take a look at the report that we've published with data art because um, you'll find the same um, overview in there as well. Um, to make it more tangible and not just the list of simple, uh, simple words, um, I now want to hand it over to Dimitro. Um, he will show you some selected use cases that uh, data art has already put in place. Um, many thanks and Dimitro, your turn. Thank you very much, Yannick. Uh, so great to be here and uh... I will tell you more about our experience uh, in finance uh, within classical machine learning and generative AI in data art. So we are working for the last uh, more than 10 years with financial data and uh, data science in AI. And we did a bunch of projects starting from the first stages like discovery, prototyping, and moving to the MVP and production stage. One of these examples was the loan def default prediction project, which we built for the financial organization. And uh, it was used to predict whether the person will return the loan or not and automated the process of loan decision making uh, we also did the advanced data management project where we worked uh, with the documents of different types streamlining uh, document processing operations uh, for financial team and also we are building the uh, virtual assistant solutions with generative ai uh, on automation of the emails so let's dive deeper into each of these use cases, and we'll be able to see the demo of the last one a bit later so on the loan default prediction project it was pretty complex data set with eight uh, different parts of it with eight different tables representing the clients operations uh, previous loans some data from the other bureaus and credit scores so our goal was to get it all together and prepare the model which will predict whether the person will return credit or not so it was the binary classification program uh, problem and um, it was quite a complex one because the data and the accuracy uh, is quite important here and uh, we uh, did uh, as you see on the diagram here on the left, we did a lot of steps making sure that we are doing the proper data engineering and the proper feature engineering process to be able to prepare the best data set available to build the model. Eventually, we have finalized on building the uh, good model with 80% of accuracy uh, of based on all of these data, data sets. And um, we're using the modern techniques uh, for tabular data sets like uh, LightGBM uh, model uh, architecture to perform the uh, training of the model, hyperparameter optimization with Hyperopt library for tuning the best uh, model parameters, and libraries like Sharp to understand what's inside these models and understand how these models behave to see what's inside and see what properties are the main ones for making this decision so we are not only building the black box solution but we are opening this uh, white box in the solution and uh, opening what's inside this uh, what what can be inside this machine learning model so eventually we got the pipeline for uh, automatic prediction of the probability that the person will not return the loan and this helps to improve decision making and uh, can be extended with more data sets and to other credit risks problem as well on the next slide we'll see the other use case with a different data type uh, with the documents so documents are uh, free text files and uh, usually they contain images tables and this is pretty complex data structure so we need to understand how to work with the financial specific wording with the numbers and the tables and uh, for that we are using the modern generative ai uh, models and methods and um, we're working uh, again with financial organization to extract the specific data out of the uh out of the document so for instance it can be the total amount or it can be the company name or it can be some specific entities uh, within the organization and this is used for uh 
reducing the manual work and for automatically extracting uh, these specific uh, data points to the database. So basically doing the structured data out of instruction data. This is also not straightforward problem. And uh, we did a round of um, tunings and uh, used different NLP techniques to uh, extract the text and to then uh, explain um, how it's working. And uh, as this model and this approach was integrated within the client's infrastructure, uh, within the admin panel. So we had an opportunity to load the documents, then it was automatically classified and the data was extracted with the uh, large language models and the insights were stored uh, within the data store. So again, this data uh, from the invoices or contracts can be used uh, for further uh, analysis and predictive modeling uh, or just data science and uh, uh, exploration of uh, the uh, documents. Uh, which is important for um, most of the business as well, because we usually have tons and thousands of documents and uh, we cannot do anything with them before uh, reading them through or extracting the data. Uh, on, on the last slide, uh, we'll see the example of the uh, like more modern uh, generative AI virtual assistant solution. Uh, so this was done in pretty similar manner to the Clarin example mentioned before. Uh, to the customer inquiries, uh, replying to the customer inquiries is uh, one of the big parts of the support team. And we all know that there are different channels like emails, uh, chats, and uh, calls. And this specific project was uh, built to automate the uh, email generation part. And I'll show this demo uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, we were building the pipeline for uh, addressing the incoming inquiries, classifying these inquiries, uh, extracting the specific uh, data, and automatically generating the response to this email. So it was not fully automated system, but mm, this system helped the live agents to see more structured uh, response, more structured data out of the long emails, and also see the pre-built uh, customized reply, which they can read through or just click send. So we and sometimes could automate a big amount of work and uh, querying a lot of internal data sources by just understanding the context and tuning the model, the large language model to behave as one of these assistants. So this led to uh, automate like 70% of the uh, common questions automatically. And in all other cases, we have the warmed up response and the um, agents can see uh, what to reply. It also can work with the uh, voice and with the calls at, as well. Uh, and uh, this can be extended, the solution can be extended with the mm, other uh, types of the mm, data uh, like calls as well. So let's see uh, the simple demo uh, on the emails, uh, which I'll show and explain how these uh, may work. Uh, so this is a very simple solution which we built internally to show how um, these type of things can work. And uh, I prepared a couple of email examples to show uh, what would be the response. So in this case, we have a couple of different topics uh, uh, of the email. And uh, this one exactly is some unrecognized charges on the account. So the customer is writing to the retail banking organization uh, saying that this is my account number and I reviewed my bank statement of this date and discovered some different uh, strange charges, unrecognized transactions. So these are the transactions. And uh, I'm very certain I did not authorize these transactions. And the clients uh, send some number and some email uh, and asks, please, like, help me with this transaction. So uh, by pressing the button, the large language model works in the background. And we see, like, very fast, we are getting the structured data, the JSON in this case, uh, which is available for further integration or just reviewing. And we see that it automatically extracted the customer name. Uh, it also could extract the customer email, but in this case, we don't have this uh, email contact email written in text. We also have some cell phone number and uh, this part is just extracting the data. And this part is what the model uh, come up with uh, as internal uh, properties. So we 
correctly classified that this goes into fraud report category. In this case, solution contains a number of different categories and uh, can direct whether this is fraud report or some other inquiry. It also can detect some tones of the conversation. So this type of tone is formal, but a bit concerned. And it also can classify to which email mailing list you need to send this email so basically it also helps to triage your emails and with some automation in place by doing this intermediate step we can already uh, target very uh, carefully the mailing list for uh, replying to this email so we will not be even sending it to everyone but just sending you can send it to a specific person who is free with some integration or to some mailing list to pick it up to a specific team and also we have the automatically generated response where we can see that of course, we need some extra details, and this is the usual step. So we say, thank you very much for reaching out. Uh, we have received your email, and we want also to know some details, your full name, uh, some copy of your ID, just some verification in terms of whether this person really is uh, owner of this account. And as only we receive this information, we are able to proceed with the investigation. So again, you can see that this is pretty good email written in the uh, good conversation form in a polite way and this can be tuned it can be uh, like automatic fully it can be uh, templatized but also it can uh, be built on top of the input query as well so let's see uh, the other type of email and how it will work within the same solution uh, so in this case uh, the our use case is the we need some help for activating new cards and setting the pin. So it's very also uh, one of the use cases. Uh, and uh, Mr. John Smith writes to the bank with the card account ending 6789. And uh, they say that uh, here are my details and card expiry date. I want to activate my card, but I cannot activate. And as a result, I'm unable to use my card for daily transactions, which is quite inconvenient. So he can be. Uh, request the assistance. As we see, we have again customer name correct, correctly extracted. We don't have any emails or phone here. Uh, we can see that this is the different topic. So it's card activation and PIN issues. And uh, the tones is more or less friendly and formal. And we have again another email for credit card support uh, for sending. Uh, this. So again, it understands the differences and correctly classifies it. And uh, again, as you see, this response is built on top of the request, on top of the email, incoming email. So it quotes uh, your details and confirms that yes, we did receive, but we also need some at least phone number or some kind of error message so we can help you better. Um, so you see uh, the different problems require different follow-up emails and it's all up to agent how to proceed. But this is again the warm start and it's a good starting point for the new agents as well. So let's see the last example uh, for the immediate request for credit limit review and increase. So this customer is quite angry and deeply dissatisfied that they do not have the uh, correct credit credit limit and uh, they, it's very critical for them and their loyal customers and they urgently need this uh, fix and they provide the phone and email and we again extract that, we select the topic, we understand that the tone is quite serious and angry and we also directed to credit card support team to understand what's happening here uh, with their email. Uh, and again, automatically generated follow-up email uh, and uh, asking for some details uh, and just confirming that thank you very much, we received and understand your concerns and apologize for any inconvenience. Again, you see that all of these emails are structured in the same way, but using different phrases. So you can think of the similar person writing these emails. It can be built out of the templates, but in this case, we are not using any type of templates. We are just um, explaining the task of this uh, bot, if you want. Uh, this solution is built on Azure OpenAI services. So it use, uses secure uh, OpenAI model deployment, which lets us to use the large language models in clouds and uh, be uh, be on the safe side with the security and data privacy uh, as, as, as not always with um, 
chat GPT, public chat GPT. So this uses the private APIs for building this solution. Uh, again, this is just an example. It can be tuned. It, your internal data knowledge bases can be added here. The, all the JSONs can be tuned, but the, this is to understand how these models can be used within the customer support and to help your organizations deliver faster responses and increase their customer support level. So that's it from my side for demo. And uh, I probably need to pass back to Stephen uh, to continue on the presentation discussion. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dimitru, for these very tangible um, examples. Um, I'd like to round off the, this, this, this presentation with um, uh, two slides on the question how to actually transform your organization so it becomes AI ready. We have learned a lot about the potential behind these things, that the technology is already quite advanced. Um, what for me stands out very much is the quote from uh, uh, Jamie Dimon, the, the, the JP Morgan CEO, who says, um, the impact is going to be extraordinary, but we don't know the full effect yet. Meaning we need to work with these topics and uh, start experimenting in order to be ready and uh, uh, develop um, future uh, 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 differentiation. Um, factors. So the question is how to get this actually done. And uh, there are two things. You need a structured approach and a lot of soft things. And uh, here I'd like to start with a few soft success factors because out of our experience, they are very often overseen or not uh, treated with a high priority, but um, actually they're, 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 they're really, really important. Three most important ones here are pointed out. You need a, a vision driven by the top management. Uh, you need to develop an AI playground and have a certain adaptability in the way how you work with um, AI. Um, what it means, um, if you want to transform your organization into becoming AI ready and develop future um, 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 differentiation, uh, factors, you need to create passion and momentum, and this is key for the leadership. Also, they need to align, of course, um, um, these, these, these parties here with the overall strategy and make sure there's a robust governance um, set up. So an AI playground doesn't belong to the IT department, for example. It's something you need to do as an uh, organization uh, as a whole, and there are going to be uh, different dilemmas or different uh, 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 interests and conflicts between IT and regulation and compliance on the one hand and uh, uh, the growth-oriented functions on the other hand. So this is something which has to be foreseen, and we see first companies actually uh, developing chief AI officers in the board. Second topic is you need to develop an AI playground. What do we mean here? Um, it's actually a playground to test around and play without focusing so much on regulation or legacy IT. So minimalistic infrastructure, the ability to test and learn, and you need cross-functional task forces so that you get actually all, all uh, perspectives from the organization into uh, this playground and uh, a spirit of being able to test and, 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 and become creative, which is the basis then for the third success factor, uh, adaptability. Um, so to create a spirit of failing fast, pivoting, playing around, having quick it uh, iteration cycles, um, and uh, starting with uh, POCs, um, so pilots, and uh, what's also important when rolling out certain pilots to have a clear responsibility for selected use cases, uh, owners who drive these things and feel responsibility, responsible in making this uh, uh, successful. And what you also need to keep in mind, this can develop a very, very positive radiation into the whole organization. So um, if you have best practices and great little success stories, this can really help the organization become ready for AI and, and, and uh, uh, create a certain spirit um, and uh, change the culture, which is very, very positive. But aside from these um, soft aspects, there is also a structured approach required on the next page. Um, and. Uh, this is just a very, very high level view, four steps. First of all, you need to map and rank uh, potential use cases, then develop a proof of concept um, out of prioritized use cases, 
roll out the use cases or the proof of concept use cases which have um, 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 crossed certain quality gates successfully and then you need to revisit the um, 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 AI portfolio as we call it and uh, iterate these things. So it's actually a circle. You always start with um, prioritizing and uh, evaluating potential AI use cases based on their potential positive impact and their ease of implementation and the ones with the highest priority step by step you let let them flow through the POCs and see if they actually meet the uh, hypothesis you 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 have defined um, for them um, in order to be rolled out. Very often you have to pivot or test if you can can uh, change something. Um, but in the end, this process of pivoting, POC, discussing this throughout the organization actually helps um, become comfortable with these topics and uh, transform the organization um, yeah, for this new phase um, and uh, 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 leveraging all these um, potentials on the cost side, on the growth side and the risk side. So much from me. So Alex, back to you. And I think we now have a Q&A session, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you to our speakers. That's a really exciting and insightful presentation. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're now entering the Q&A session. Please engage, share your question in the chat to our speakers. Um, your participation will enrich our discussion. I will start uh, with a couple of questions and uh, yeah, we will proceed with the questions from the chat. So um, you mentioned that AI has been around for decades. What's the reason it, it, you know, the hype is right now? Why is it so popular? I can try to start with this one. Uh, so to my understanding that each year, each decade, we started to see more advanced methods and tools around the AI. And uh, right now it became uh, so clear that it's very simple and each person can use it with the chat modes, uh, even though uh, it's not the, you know, a classical AI, it's the new type of AI or like generative AI, but still uh, for the years we had these tools, they were integrated into some solutions built on statistics, but now they are becoming more and more uh, broad and AI is working with more different data types and becoming more accessible. That's why when it touches like each human and each human can uh, try it, I think it's the adoption curve starting to grow. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, I think this accessibility is the key driver. And then, like before, ha before that, um, it was like the, the the technical advancements that made this all possible. I mean, we have way better um, computer chips and GPUs now. We have cloud services, which like lead to some easier deployment. Um, the models themselves changed. I guess <laughs> you know that way better, Dimitro. Um, but uh, they also advance in the logic that they work and. All of this, um, then you have additional funding coming in. This is accelerated. This also adds some more additional funding. And then someday uh, a, a bank CEO is uh, able to experience it, just like you just uh, said, Dimitro. And this is where this can lift up because nowadays everybody knows what AI is. And five years ago, only the tech department and only probably 5% of them knew about what they can actually do. Thank you. Yeah, I really like the practical part when um, when you showed the actual uh, demo. So, if I would to transform my organization with AI, um, how do I actually start if I have zero experience expertise in it? Uh, is I can I can also continue. So. Um... I think that uh, the recommendations which, which Stephen gave uh, make sense to me. Uh, I think that the practical AI playground part is really important uh, to like 
move through the regulations and compliance and make sure you have some place to experiment. I think it's really important because it helps to understand your use cases and try with real world data. And uh, I highly encourage again to try all, all these uh, like chatbots and tools and think how you can use them within your daily work. And this gives you more automation and more support and also like better understanding of how uh, complex solutions can be done like the one which uh, I just demoed. So I think that playground part is really important to start. And I think we see in all organization at the moment, um, people who are really excited and passionate about this topic. So it's um, about uh, providing them the basis to actually work with this passion and test things and uh, provide them the right structures to um, 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 improve certain processes and use cases. Um, and and uh, 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 that's that's what we actually mean, creating a framework, governance, playground to um, 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 use their, their, their own um, incentives um, um, uh, to, to, to develop these uh, cases. Yeah, sounds good. And um, Mitro, you, the, the demo that you shared, so let's say for a bank, um, how long like time-wise does it generally take to set up a similar, let's say proof of concept and uh, how customizable that can be? Yeah, so uh, we are building such solutions like each day in different industries. And uh, in our experience, uh, it has different stages. And uh, of course, we need to start from some discovery, understand your requirements and understand uh, why you want to build this use case and how you eventually want to use it. So this part uh, usually all takes like two to four weeks to understand and structure and uh, write it all down. Then the real development part, it takes around uh, usually like six weeks from start to till the uh, deployed solution like you see right now to deploy the prototype and so for your stakeholders and yourself to see how it works and why it's working and to see the cornerstones and then uh, for then we are moving to MVP uh, so MVP may take different amount of time depending on the complexity of the POC if in POC we achieved better accuracy we can just work on the integration and on the deployment to the production environment uh, this can take uh, for instance like uh, four to six weeks if you want to improve something it can take and it can add on top of this timeline uh, but usually uh, for banks uh, what is needed uh, if it's the use case understanding it's some data which is uh, which can be used to develop on this use case and some environment uh, to try it on and of course the skills uh, of people who can basically build that and uh, more importantly evaluate that and move it to production which is the complex part uh, as we see right now perfect yeah and um, what are the main like biggest mistakes the companies make uh in the context of ai that you see well i i would say it's it's the extremes at both ends you know um so one big mistake is not doing anything and not starting to explore and not like waiting for something magic to happen um so that uh, suddenly you can use it and you're able to so um i think I think starting exploring and understanding and bringing it um, into your own company is crucial. And then on the other hand, what we also see is like trying to put AI in every and on every problem that you have um, without really thinking about like, like, is that the right way to solve it? Um, or am I, am I, Am I, am, am I able to do it another way? So from my perspective, AI is super powerful and it will be very important and will, it will probably in 10 years there, there will be at least a small amount of AI and many, many things that we, that we use and do every day. Um, but still it's, 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 it's just a tool, you know? It is a tool that you can use and it should be part of your toolbox and that's what you need to learn um and you need to bring to your own toolbox basically um but 
you, you cannot solve everything or you should not, you probably can, you should not solve every problem with AI. All right. We, we have actually a question in the chat. I will maybe follow up on the previous one, Mitro. Um, so implementing wise, what are the challenges that uh, you see when working with, with other banks? So for the challenges, uh, I think uh, the main challenge is the, you know, long, you know, sometimes it's good to plan in advance, like generate 50 use cases and then think which is the best and select it as a strategy and then, uh, you know, move to implementation. But sometimes uh, I think one of the problems, not only in banks, but overall, that um, f f like two things. First of all, uh, like AI is not for this year like we will not be doing anything we'll just wait and see how it goes i think it's uh like we can do better right there is no harm in just trying and the second one is uh spending a lot of time for finding the first use case so if like for the first use case my recommendation is to like take a look at your competitors and the industry success stories and repeat it within the fixed timelines for your company if you feel like this customer support help agent will help you like plan to do the same see how it works see how this behaves for your organization and then enhance to more complex use cases customizations as well or if you want to buy a product and try with a product like it's also as i said start a good starting point but uh like the challenges is that uh the companies should should um, be open to trying and should be open to the use cases and uh, the kind of consequences of using this AI. So probably the AI will not fire the whole team, but uh, the team should be able to be trained to use AI for their daily work, to be more competitive and to be more uh, productive. Thank you. Yeah. So the question from the chat, um, we see that Klarna clarified that uh, the staff reduction didn't go as smooth as they initially claimed to be. So are you aware of any Gen AI examples, not machine learning specifically, which are in production and led to staff reductions in operations or IT? Mm. Uh, this is this is actually a great question um, because at the end, using uh, AI, Gen AI in operations is um, an efficiency in efficiency improvement uh, measure, which very often leads to staff reductions. So the question, of course, is what do companies um, um, communicate publicly? And uh, usually it's, uh, they're freeing up capacity to um, 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 use it more productive. Um, this very often is not, 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 not really possible. So I'm, I'm very sure in many, many of these cases, um, um, this, this is leading to certain staff reductions. What I would watch in this context is the um, Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation. They've just um, finalized a pilot with uh, over 1,000 bank clerks. Um, and this pilot was actually highly successful, um, and they are now rolling it out to uh, 30,000 of their bank clerks. Um, and uh, I'm sure there will be um, either public announcements or uh, someone, some, 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 some news you can read between the lines. Thank you. Um, do you have any addition to that? Should we proceed? Uh, I, I generally agree. Uh, the only thing I can remember that um, some time ago, Google told that uh, they are um, reducing their ads department in terms of AI. But again, we don't know how much of this is true and what are the amounts and how this AI will be eventually and exactly used. Uh, so probably there, I agree with Steven, mostly there might be some reductions, but uh, like, it all should be seen probably in a, on a scale like two to five years to really see the impact. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, it becomes a sensitive topic when uh, sharing this information publicly. Um, and I believe the Clarin example just proves it. So, yeah. yeah. Mm, I have a quick question maybe 
so Yannick, you mentioned um, there are different models com competing heavily. So who do you think will be the winner at the end and who should we put our stake on? Um, I, I mean, when we look at what, what happened, there was, it's a race and sometimes the one model is the best and the other one is the best. Um, from my perspective, I believe that it will become commoditized. So these, these basic large models that you see, um, like ChatGPT um, or Gemini or Llama 3 or whatever, they will probably all end up at kind of the same level. Um, also because um, one big challenge is that the, the data to train the models is also running out someday. So potentially the companies that do have enough data um, or have access to certain data that other ones don't have, they might have some advances there and may get to some certain levels quicker, but I believe that it will be commoditized someday. And then interestingly, um, this whole discussion about open source language models, um, is from my perspective, also part of that. I think most of the companies do not like, like open up their code. Um, it's funny that it's called OpenAI when they're the most closed company in the world, kind of. Um, but um, what Meta is doing currently is that they will, um, as far as I know, provide their Llama 3 model open source which is an interesting and probably also very smart move towards um, their competition because it um, makes things available to the, like, like the broad audience and um, people can use it for their own development. Um, and this also will drive commoditization um, further. Um, so I, I don't believe that there will be a clear winner in the end. It, um, for certain specialized models, you will use them for certain specialized tasks because we talked about like resource efficiency and things like that as well. But no one will have this super big AI as we know it at the moment. Um, general AI might be something um, else someday, but I think we're too far away from that at the moment. What do you think, Dimitro, from a tech perspective? Uh, well, you know, I think it will be step by step, and uh, I mostly agree with the approach that uh, again of open AI, where they, where they gradually increase the uh, like complexity of the model and the capabilities of the model. So I feel like it would be gradually improvement, and if to compare, you know, like today with the plus five years, we'll see the big impact, but eventually like comparing the models within one year may not be a uh, big impact. Uh, but, you know, machine learning was advancing by a bit each each year and uh, research is going. So, um, yeah, I think we'll have some limits, but um, I'm not sure uh, like how much time we need to like fix, uh, change the model architecture and address these limits. Uh, it also basically um, it's very hard to say where where this all will stop and uh, like how much data we'll have. So it may be you know exponential growth, and uh, the more data we have, the more the better models we have, uh, the more we get. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Perfect. So we reached the time limit, and um, yeah, I would like to extend uh, the gratitude for the audience, for everyone who stayed to the very end and definitely to our esteemed speakers. Um, I think the exploration was insightful and we dwell into the AI in retail banking and payments. So uh, as we conclude, I want to remind everyone that the recording of today's session and the Q&A segment and the highlights of this webinar, we will be sharing that after uh, the webinar with you. So please check your emails for those uh, resources. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to our continued collaboration uh, and let's shape the future of the financial technology. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.